As always, I want to thank our sponsors. Um, the English Bonner Mitchell Foundation, as you know, has been the primary sponsor of the Omnibus Lecture Series now for 15 years, and uh, we couldn't be more grateful to them. And then, of course, uh, Wayne TV, News Channel 15, and Northeast Indiana Public Radio are our media sponsors. Uh, after the lecture tonight, there will be a question and answer period. Uh, let me try to train you a little bit. I apologize for this. Uh, during the, the Winkler-Matlin lecture, uh, we set up two microphones, one down in the lower area and one in the upper area. Please use those microphones to ask questions. Um, it's, it's very easy to, uh, to get behind them. And then everybody can hear what your question is. And that makes it a whole lot easier, both on the speaker and, and on the audience. So if you would, if you would use the, the floor mic and the slightly higher floor mic, that would be a, a great boon to the question and answer session. Also, uh, as usual, please try not to manage a monologue, uh, but do ask a question. We're delighted to have your questions, and I know the speaker is delighted to answer them. Uh, at the conclusion of that, there will be a book signing, and Mr. Galbraith will be available to sign books in the outer area in the lobby. And to introduce Mr. Galbraith, uh, John Kessler, the director of the IPFW Center for Economic Education and the advisor to our uh, Federal Reserve Challenge uh, team, will introduce Mr. Galbraith. So, Mr. Kessler. Good evening. We're here this evening because of the current state of the economy. The financial crisis, the recession, the next Great Depression, whatever you want to call it, it's on everyone's mind. We've all been affected by it. Jobs have been lost, home prices have dropped, and 401ks have lost value. We all have questions. The economics profession has debated macroeconomic issues for decades. Names like John Maynard Keynes and Milton Friedman have shaped the debate, and yet today we still have more questions than answers. I am pleased to welcome to IPFW Dr. James Galbraith, a well-known scholar in his own right. Dr. Galbraith is also the son of renowned economist John Kenneth Galbraith. His experience and research places Dr. Galbraith in a unique situation to provide us with some insight into the current situation. Dr. Galbraith teaches economics and a variety of other subjects at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs and the University of Texas Austin's Department of Government. He studied economics at Harvard, where he received his bachelor's degree in 1974, and at Yale, where he received his PhD in economics in 1981. He studied economics as a Marshall Scholar at King's College, Cambridge, and later served on the staff of the U.S. Congress, including as Executive Director of the Joint Economic Committee before joining the faculty of the University of Texas. He held a Fulbright Distinguished Visiting Lectureship in China in the summer of 2001 and was named a Carnegie Scholar in 2003. His recent research has focused on the measurement and understanding of inequality in the world economy, while his policy writing ranges from monetary policy to the economics of warfare, with forays into politics and history. He's the head of the University of Texas Inequality Project, and his most recent book is The Predator State, How Conservatives Abandon the Free Market and Why Liberals Should Too. The recent economic downturn has heated up the discussion between monetarists and Keynesians, and as the debate over the macroeconomic implications of the recent recession wages on, we are pleased to welcome Dr. James Galbraith to give us his insight into the financial crisis. Please join me in welcoming Dr. James Galbraith. Thank you very much, John. And let me say it is a great pleasure for me to be with you uh, tonight here in Fort Wayne. We are two years and two months into the greatest financial crisis that any of us has ever seen. 
It started in August of 2007. We were also coming up within a few days on the 80th anniversary of the one similar event in history that was actually greater, the Great Crash of 1929, uh, the prelude to the Great Depression. I seriously doubt there is anyone here who was present then, but if there is, I further doubt that you remember it. <laughs> My father, who uh, would have been, well, would have reached his 101st birthday tomorrow, uh, had just turned 21 when that event occurred. And uh, 26 years later, he would make his uh, literary reputation on it with the publication of a little book called The Great Crash, 1929, uh, which is uh, still in print today. And in fact, we are issuing a new edition of The Great Crash to mark this rather um, interesting anniversary. I have got a foreword in that edition, which is a little bit, at least in our family terms, like writing a graffiti on the face of the Mona Lisa. Well, what I would like to do with you tonight uh, is to uh, take the opportunity to assess where we stand um, 26 months into the events that we are now living through, and then to place them uh, to some degree into that larger historical context. As it happened, I was in Argentina. 26 months ago, when the news arrived that the markets for interbank lending, the loans that banks make uh, to one another on a daily basis to help each other meet their demands for liquidity, had frozen up. It was a very good place to be out on the Pampas driving along uh, among people for whom financial crises are uh, very commonplace events, and for whom the scale of the crisis that we're going through uh, often seems rather rudimentary child's play compared to their own experience. Because they have a very good feel uh, for the character of this news. And my host immediately told me, uh, first of all, that this was going to be a very big deal. And secondly, that it was going to be downplayed, it was going to be understated in all the official media. He said, uh, they're calling it a liquidity crisis. In a couple of months, they'll be calling it a solvency crisis. And of course, he was exactly right. What that tells us is that financial crises, uh, which are, although they're an experience that, with which we do not have uh, a whole lot of familiarity, they are fairly common events, widespread in the world, and they follow a certain dynamic or logic of their own. Hyman Minsky, an economist whose name was not heard too much until a couple of years ago, but is now on everyone's lips, stated the essential, uh, an essential aspect of this phenomenon, which is that stability itself is the problem. Stability breeds instability. It makes people confident. It gives them a certain uh, inoculation against the fear of risk. It makes them discontented with the low returns that other people are accustomed to making. It causes them to accept 
great or leverage it causes them to be willing to skirt closer and closer to the law. And so there is a tendency for a stable system in a, um, <clears throat> under a regime of financial capitalism to destabilize itself. And that's what happened in October of 1929. There had been a vast inflow of what was called call money to Wall Street, fueling the purchase on margin of common stocks. The great invention of leverage and the investment trust, investment trust sometimes nested in other investment trusts, invested in nested in further in other investment trusts, pyramid schemes in other words, permitted a vastly amplified gain. And so long as the market kept rising, which it did for years, so long as nobody panicked, the money kept flowing in. It would not continue, and there were a few people who knew it and said so. One of them was the young Joseph P. Kennedy, who sold out in the summer of 1929 and said that only a fool holds out for the top dollar. But by and large, of course, the nature of these events most of the participants play the fool. They expect the thing to continue, if not forever, at least longer than it actually does. In 2007, the mechanics were essentially similar. The price that had to keep rising was in housing, and house prices had never fallen on a year-over-year -year basis in the United States since the 1940s. So long as house prices continue to rise, <coughs> mortgages, however badly drawn up, however improbable and unstable, could in principle be refinanced. And the funds so raised could be sunk back to support consumption and therefore employment. And of course, with the help of the ever increasing amounts of leverage to support more housing. But this required a vast suspension of skepticism and disbelief. It required that no one look too closely at just how bad those mortgages were. It required one to believe that the market could price the extraordinarily complicated securities that were based on those mortgages correctly, and that the risk associated with those securities could be uh, distributed across investors and insurers in a rational and stable way. <clears throat> I was at a meeting in Italy in July, and I had the privilege of being with uh, the former president of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev. And I told him, Mr. President, this is in my presentation, that. Uh, when the history of this was written, it would be said that when the Homer returned to write the history of this epic, he would say that the Russian mathematicians had swept out of Muscovy in 1991, presented themselves before the gates of Wall Street bearing the gift of quantitative risk management models. They were accepted with joy, set to work, and in less than 20 years they had destroyed the place. It was the greatest Trojan horse operation since Troy. Gorbachev said, I've been accused of worse things than that. <laughs> also required that the changed methods 
for evaluating, for rating those securities, methods which did not depend upon looking at the documentation that lay beneath, would not induce change in the way the underlying mortgages were made. People in the industry knew this was not so. And they had a kind of code to express how they felt about it. I learned this just a few weeks ago. The code consisted of six letters, IBG, UBG. It meant, I'll be gone, you'll be gone. In fact, of course, when you issue a license to steal, the reality is the thieves get busy. That should come as no surprise, no shock to anyone. It's one of the first principles of economics. Incentives work. If you let free money, leave free money lying around on the ground, someone is going to come along and pick it up. What is shocking, and I think really truly shocking in this situation, is the extent to which the regulators and, I have to say, the professional economists who style themselves as experts on regulation either did not see or pretended not to see what was going on. It's hard to tell which of those is exactly the case. My friend Paul Krugman wrote in the New York Times a month ago that the economists mistook beauty for truth, a pretty damaging uh, accusation on its own. But I think the reality is actually less innocent. It is that <clears throat> things that could be said in the corridors amongst oneself could not be said or would not be said to the public or in a way that would affect the policymaking process. And this was particularly true by economists in positions of power. I think there's considerable evidence that they did see and that they chose to pretend, chose to permit, and even to encourage what was the greatest episode of financial misconduct. Uh, in the history, certainly, of this country. I don't believe for a minute that Alan Greenspan, to name a name, was unaware of the risks of financial crisis, and I think there is some evidence in his work that he was very clearly aware of it. But it served purposes, both political and economic in the short term, to let the events take their course. And there was the added thought that with a certain amount of luck, the consequences would fall on the next administration, whether we're talking about the next administration in the White House or the next administration at the Federal Reserve. How bad were those mortgages? We know in qualitative terms that they were given out to people who could not document their incomes, that's what a subprime or an Alt-A mortgage is, whose credit histories were bad or non-existent, that the houses were overvalued, appraised by people who were paid for their willingness to issue an inflated appraisal, and that the originators had no incentive to care about any of this, in fact, quite the reverse, because the larger the mortgage, the greater the fee when it was sold uh, to the investing, to the commercial bank, the investment bank that would turn it into an instrument for the investing public. We know this in qualitative terms. To this day, we do not have a good idea of how serious the matter was in quantitative terms. We do not have a systematic appraisal, a clear and credible audit. And the reason appears to be that the assets remain on the books to a very large degree of the banks, 
And the government, which is responsible for regulating those banks, doesn't want to know what their actual condition is. There were so-called stress tests, you may remember, early this year. They were unlike stress tests, evaluations of bank conditions that are normally conducted. The banks were allowed to use their own models, and the results were negotiated with the banks behind closed doors before they were released to the public. That has all the earmarks of an exercise in public relations. There was no inspection as part of those tests of the underlying mortgage documents. There has been pressure from Congress for the U.S. Treasury to conduct such inspection. It has so far been deflected and resisted. What do we know? We know that in 2007, one ratings agency, Fitch, conducted a survey of a small sample of mortgage instruments. They had 49, a very small sample, uh, that had been associated with highly rated securities. And when they looked at them, they found what they said in their report was, quote, fraud or misrepresentation in virtually every file. And we have one bank, at least, IndyMac in California, which was taken over by the FDIC. IndyMac was a major originator of subprime and Alt-A mortgages, and it had originated a total of about $90 billion of those mortgages, of which it had sold, and no longer had on its books, some $75 billion. The remaining $15 billion were on its books when it failed. One can imagine that that was the better $15 billion. The FDIC has written off, I believe, $12 billion of that fifteen. So we have some sense of the extent to which uh, the underlying assets have fallen in value and to the extent to which they may or may not, in my view, do not have the potential to recover in whatever the economy does. The crisis, of course, broke into the open in a major way. It built over 2007 and 2008 with this major episode in March uh, with the uh, uh, forced sale of Bear Stearns, but it broke wide open in September of 2008 uh, with the collapse of Lehman Brothers and very quickly the forced mergers or conversion to bank holding companies of every major investment bank in the United States. Uh, and at that time also the beginnings of a run, frankly, on the banking system and on the commercial paper and money market mutual funds. I made a couple of observations at the time by way of predictions to the press. One was that I did not think it would be a replay of the Great Depression. And I gave some reasons for that, which I'll come back to shortly. And the other was that, nevertheless, it would be very ugly and very protracted, very slow to resolve. And this was for a simple reason. This was not a slump in manufacturing where factories close, are shuttered, the machinery is taken away, and the thing is gone. So that in, when demand recovers, it becomes necessary to build a new factory somewhere in order to supply the demand for those products. This is a case of a housing slump. And houses are out there in neighborhoods and communities, and they stay out there until they are sold, reoccupied, or until they fall into disuse and are shuttered, vandalized, or torn down. And however the problem is resolved, it's a slow process to clear millions and millions of units off of the market. And for the, the, all the mortgages that go upside down in that situation to come back up so that people are free, in some sense, to, uh, uh, to go back to normal uh, economic life. It had taken seven years for this to happen in a regional slump in Texas in the middle 1980s when I first arrived there, and no reason existed to think that on a national basis it would resolve itself more quickly 
than that. I've seen no reason since then to change that second judgment. I'm still not entirely sure about the first. On a world scale, indicators of uh, manufacturing and of trade that have emerged in the year since the crisis, as I say, broke open, are in fact just as bad as they were in the 1930s. What saves us is that those activities are a smaller part of total activity now than they were then. We have more services, we have bigger government, we have a welfare state, which work to stabilize things. And there's also the fact that as a people, we're very much richer now than we were then. And so we have further to fall. The effect of a fall in income doesn't manifest itself in hunger as quickly as it did back then. But these are things which give you a difference, perhaps, of quantity. It's not so clear what the qualitative difference is. The approach of the previous administration, President Bush, and especially Secretary Paulson, who by this time was very much in charge of the policy process to the crisis, was basically one of an effort to forestall and delay events. Uh, uncharitably, perhaps accurately, it's been suggested that the motive was to push off the worst until after the election of November 2008. And if so, one has to give Secretary Paulson credit, he nearly succeeded. Close doesn't count in this game, but still. Uh, <clears throat> with the purchase of Bear Stearns, okay, that problem was put back into the box. But even more so over this period, the Treasury was placing pressure on two large entities, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who had been privatized but originated as public companies, to stock up on the toxic assets and to try and get them off the market market, an effort which resulted in the demise of both of those companies. And then it became clear that, as a friend of mine has put it into an article title, Lehman Brothers was too big to bail, with the result that we had this remarkable week of panic. Uh, a high drama on Capitol Hill, uh, and then over the course of a week in which the stock market and everything else uh, was collapsing, a series of measures that uh, were a battalion of little Dutch boys with fingers uh, for the night, increase in deposit insurance to $250,000, the backstopping of the commercial paper market with the Exchange Stabilization Fund, the notorious TARP, initially an effort to, uh, to provide funds to repurchase the toxic assets directly, an exercise someone compared to trying to fill the Pacific Ocean with basketballs, uh, but ultimately resolved itself into the purchase by the Treasury of preferred equity in the major banks. And finally, something that was much less noticed, but very important, $600 billion of currency swaps between the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank and other central banks. A step that was taken ne made necessary by one of the oddest features of the crisis, which was that even though it originated in the United States and was the product of the regulatory negligence uh, and uh, financial malfeasance that I've already described, 
Its consequences were more destabilizing in Europe than they were here, and they set off a series of events which almost destroyed a number of European currencies, including the pound, the Swiss franc, and the euro itself. And that required the Ben Bernanke to make, uh, on what authority it is not clear, a very large loan uh, to the world system, uh, disguised as currency swaps, basically an unsecured loan, uh, to provide the dollars that suddenly everybody wanted to hold. The whole thing, it has to be said, was not ineffective. Panic was quelled. It amounted, however, practically speaking, to the nationalization of the financial system. It changed the nature of the system that we live in in a very fundamental way. This nationalization, which was effective, as I say, in every sense, except that it did not include a systematic effort to get at the essentials. That is to say, to solve the problem of housing and housing finance and foreclosures, which was sweeping the country and continues to sweep the country, to clean up the frauds, to get a clean and effective audit, and to bring people uh, responsible to account, or to exercise control in any serious way over the conduct of the major banks going forward. So I think it's possible to say that it was the banks who nationalized the government rather than the other way around. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's the real economy, the one that I think most of us probably live in. Uh, and here, what happened is that the customers for bank credit abruptly disappeared. They did so for two good reasons. They suddenly desperately wanted to hold on to whatever cash they had. And the value of the asset that they were accustomed to using to secure their loans, their housing, was collapsing so rapidly that they couldn't have qualified credit even if they had wanted it. And the withdrawal of credit meant a collapse of sales, in construction, in industry, also imports, so that the crisis spread very quickly to Asia and elsewhere in the world. And there's a fantastic reduction in employment and output and exports in China uh, as a result of this. That was the reality. And an interesting aspect of this is that the reality was at very sharp cross-purposes to the official rhetoric, uh, I think in the previous administration, but also in the new administration, which stressed over and over again that the problem was one of getting credit to flow again. One of these bewitching metaphors that conceals a very bad thought. The thought being that credit is a flow, that it somehow comes down from the banks to us, to the borrowers, and that the problem is a plumbing problem, a problem of blockage right? in the banks, and that therefore one has to or turn the plumbers loose on the banks or flood them with liquidity, which is what we call it, giving bankers money as the solution for the problem. But it's a complete misdiagnosis. Credit is not a flow. Credit is a contract. It is a deal between a lender and a borrower. And it was, in this case, the customers who quit for good and sufficient reasons of their own as they say, they preferred the safety of cash uh, because they also realized that they had a pretty good substitute in the short run for a new car or a new refrigerator or a new piece of electronic consumer electronics, which was the old car or the old refrigerator that they already had.
A fix directed at the banks was never going to solve that problem, and it has not done so. The crash in private spending was offset, as there was another dimension to the response to this crisis, and that was on what we call the fiscal side, the side of public spending and taxation. In the first instance, when people lose their incomes, their tax burdens go down, so their spending power doesn't fall as much as their incomes do. And at the same time, when they lose their jobs, the government kicks in unemployment insurance or disability and other forms of relief so that, once again, total spending does not go down as much as employment or production does. The result of this immediately is a very large increase in the public deficit. And this, and I have to stress this point, is an extremely good thing. It is part of the design of a system built under Roosevelt and to some extent Kennedy, but also I think principally Lyndon Johnson, which is to a degree self-stabilizing for that reason. The public deficit is what prevents the complete collapse of total activity. Nothing else is there to do that. There are people who say <clears throat> that the deficits are bad. And I suggest to you they're like the patient with pneumonia who wants to get off the antibiotics. He's confusing the illness with the treatment. The deficits are the treatment. They're not the illness. Most of this, as I said before, was automatic. It's built into the system, nothing to do with anything current policymakers did. But then, in addition, there was the stimulus package, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, now known, I think, to all of us as the American Tie Us Up in Traffic Act. <laughs> Have you been driving lately? This delay was brought to you by the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. I can't imagine why. If you were a highway department, you would put up a sign like that. You see them everywhere. Uh, but it is helping. It adds something. And the Act also adds to the ability of state and local governments to counter cuts in, for example, education programs and elsewhere. The stimulus package was not as strong as it should have been. It was weakened by political compromises that put in more tax cuts than there should have been and less direct and immediate relief, but it was far better than nothing. How good was it? Well, I think the answer to that is visible now. People who monitor these events tell me that we are now basically up to speed. The stimulus package is spending what it's going to spend at the rate that it's going to spend. It has stabilized the unemployment rate at 9.8% so far. It'll go up some more, but the vicinity of 10%. It won't do more than that. And so you can tell right away that the combination of the automatic stabilizers and the stimulus package is very far from sufficient to bring us out of the situation that we're in. So what is the present situation and what is the outlook? It is possible to paint a positive picture. And this is something which, in particular, uh, business economists, bank economists, have been doing for some months. And if you watch the press, I'm sure you've been seeing the reflection of their argument, uh, none of which is wrong. They point to the fact that, for the reasons I gave earlier, when production falls more than incomes, inventories are drawn down. When they hit zero, you have to start reordering, so production resumes. That's a good thing. It's called the inventory cycle. They point to the automatic stabilizers, which I just discussed. They point to the stimulus package. And they point to the recovery of, the apparent recovery of the banks, of the risky corporate bond market, 
and of the stock market, which is up 40 percent or so from its uh, low, and I, I, I was told that it reached 10,000 on the Dow today. So all of those are signs that a floor has been hit and that some of the greatest elements of panic uh, of six or eight months ago have passed um, and that there will be, for the next quarter or two, a positive and perhaps a relatively rapid 4 percent rate of output growth. The question is not there. The question is, what happens after that? Is the great crisis of a type that will make it difficult to move from this initial burst of growth brought on by government spending and uh, free money, the inventory cycle, to a sustained expansion of the kind that we've had several times since 1980, fueled by a renewed growth of private credit. This is where I think skepticism is in order. And I'll give you three reasons. First of all, in Washington as we speak, the pressures continue to build to pull back on the public effort. All right, people keep talking about the deficits as though, as I say, they, they were a bad thing. They keep wanting to cut off the antibiotics before the infection is finished. And I have to say the president aids and abets this when he makes an apparently off-the-cuff remark that the government is out of money. The government cannot run out of money. It's a nice thing about the government. It's different from you and me. <laughs> Similarly, talk about cutting back Social Security. Loose talk about cutting back Medicare. This is not constructive in this environment. Many people in Washington are unaware of very basic elements of accounting. They don't understand that if the dollar is going to continue to serve as an asset that the rest of the world holds, then the public budget has to be in deficit. I could go into that in more detail. You're lucky we don't have time. <laughs> On the credit front, can anything happen by way of sustained recovery before there are assets against which people can borrow? And is there any asset other than, in the great American middle class, other than housing? In other words, are we going to see a credit recovery before a housing recovery? And if not, when will that be? I think people who are expecting something like the phenomena of the past to happen within 18 months or two years are not thinking the present situation through carefully enough. And then we have to ask, what is the implication of all of this for jobs and employment? This is, uh, here I, I feel a bit humbled by my presence in this community because you know the employment situation firsthand as well as any people in the country. It's very bleak. It has not begun to recover. On the national level, it is continuing to get worse. And even as output recovers, jobs can continue to be lost. This will show up as very rapid productivity growth, which some economists like, but from the standpoint of working people, is not a good thing. It means that employers are meeting their orders with the equipment and the personnel they already have, making efficiency gains rather than adding employment. To actually get progress on employment, let alone progress against unemployment, you have to have very strong growth of demand after that. Where will it come from? I'm not saying it can't happen. A person I respect quite a lot was telling me today he thought it would be demand from China. I don't think so. 
What I'm saying is, I don't see the source of that demand coming from the private economy or the external economy, the world economy. If anyone can, is making a persuasive case to the contrary, I haven't heard that case. And I wonder, if I'm right, what the political situation will be six months or a year from now when the banks and the bankers and their bonuses have recovered, but jobs have not. Actually, it's not difficult to imagine how much more deeply poisonous, even than today, the political environment might get. And I'm not saying this, by the way, in a spirit of opposition to the present administration, which I supported and which I very much would like to succeed. It seems to me, however, critical for anyone who is in a position to reflect on these matters to do so with an open eye and a skeptical spirit so that if it's necessary to change course, we can begin to get on with the job. What should be done? I'm not in favor of another stimulus package. I think the terminology is wrong. The idea of stimulus is of a short-term effort that will restore the body economic to a normal condition of vigor. It has the aspect of a hypodermic needle with a glucose solution or something more, or perhaps something stronger, amphetamine. It's not the right metaphor. We first need to continue to stabilize the patient in the places that are still hurting. The budgets of states and localities are the most important instance of this. And it makes no sense at all for the federal government to be putting in construction money while states and localities are cutting back on teachers. The purpose of the program should be consistently to avoid any further cuts, any cuts, in state and local public services because you want those services to be there for their communities and for the economy when it recovers. The federal government should plug that budget gap and it should do it now. Secondly, if jobs are not coming back in the private sector, then they should be created by the public sector or by public-private partnership. Something could be done on the tax front, a holiday in the payroll tax or a tax credit for reducing work hours so that more people will be hired. Well, be useful ideas. It makes no sense to talk about delaying the retirement age and Social Security in these situations because you want people who are able to retire to do so and loosen up the job situation for people who've never had a chance to work. If I had a single, if I had a magic wand and could reform health care with a single stroke, it, I would reduce the age of eligibility of Medicare to 55. It's the easiest legislative program ever invented. Just move your finger from the six to the five and press once. <laughs> but it would also, in addition to solving a great many people's health problems, allow a great many people who are hanging on to their jobs but don't want them to retire is the only reason they're working is to keep their medical benefits. I would think about putting in place a fund like the Reconstruction Finance Corporation of the 30s, but focused on the nonprofit sector. Why is it that universities or hospitals, which are a mainstay of American life and ac economy, should have to cut back because the stock market has collapsed? It doesn't make any sense from an economic point of view. And I would start thinking seriously about a public jobs program, a program for green jobs, perhaps a care core to provide the kinds of services, particularly to the elderly and the infirm, that we as a society perhaps should be providing. The most critical thing, it seems to me, looking forward, 
is to impart to this economy some sense of strategic direction. In other words, and this is something which was done in the 90s with information technology, and in the last decade, although in a poisonous way, with housing, we need to give the private sector and the rest of the world a sense that America is up to something that's worthwhile, worth doing, worth financing, worth contributing to. It's a game that America has been playing with the world for most of our existence, and it's something we should not forget. It's very important to our place in the world that we continue to do it. So what is the most important problem? What are the most important problems that we should be solving? I think they're in the domain of energy, of the environment, climate change, greenhouse gas emissions, and the vast reconstruction of our infrastructure, transportation, of our housing, of our buildings, that's required to begin to come to grips with those issues, as well as the electrical grid and our energy generation, energy importing economy. These things need to be thought about, they need to be researched, they need to be planned, and they need to be implemented in a systematic and long-term way, a 10-year, 15-year, or 20-year program, which could, I think, keep a very large part of the country very usefully employed, and at the end of the day, leave the population at that time with a living standard at least as good and in some ways better than the one we enjoy, and perhaps put the pl planet on a path that is not as obviously destructive as the one it's presently on. I think if we did that in a serious and credible way, it is more likely than not that the rest of the world would put up with it, that the dollar would remain in its preeminent position, and that we would be a stabilizing and not a destabilizing force for the world economy as a whole. The Great Crash, which in many ways produced the Great Depression, demanded the New Deal as a way out. And the New Deal was a vast enterprise that rebuilt the country from one end to the other. Every rural school, a thousand airfields, 700,000 miles of roads, the Lincoln Tunnel, the uh, Triborough Bridge, the Chicago Waterfront, every courthouse in America. It's an amazing program of reconstruction and construction done at breakneck speed and at bargain prices. And then there was the Second World War, which was a vast national mobilization. It was only at the end of that that we had the economy that we grew up in of, middle, of stable middle-class prosperity for the most part. The great crisis of the last two years may or may not rise to that level. I think the jury is still out, but it is clearly bigger and more fundamental to our future than anything, as I said before, anything that we have seen in our lifetimes. And so it's surely going to require something larger, more systematic, better thought through and implemented with more vigor and energy than we have seen so far. And I think it would be very, very useful if we began to think and act systematically as if that were the case. Thank you very much indeed. I gather that there's a possibility for questions and that there are microphones uh, and uh, oh, lights are coming up, so I'm almost able to see uh, whether there's anybody who actually has a question. Uh, but if you do, come on up.
There's a question over here. Uh, Professor Galbraith, the other night on Bill Moyers, there was an economist commenting, and I thought he had a very important thing to say, specifically in regards to appropriate re-regulation of our financial industry. Appropriate what? Re-regulation of our re financial industry. Re-regulation, yes. Sir. Okay, he said it's too late. The crisis is over. We missed the opportunity, is what he thought, that now that the banks seem to be recovered, some think, that we've missed that up, that Obama administration has missed the opportunity for meaningful re-regulations of uh, derivatives, things like that. I would ask, do you share that opinion of uh, we've missed the opportunity for meaningful regulations of derivatives, et cetera? Um, I'm not prepared to accept defeat on this issue. Uh, but it is clear that we have missed a lot of opportunities. Uh, I thought that in that I, I thought that given the collapse of the previous administration, that it made sense to prop up the system from September to January. I might have been wrong about that, but I think if we hadn't taken the action, if Congress had not acted at the end of September, early October, uh, the collapse would have been truly phenomenal and very, very much more harmful than we in fact saw. But I thought that January was the moment when you would want to go in uh, and send a very clear signal to the banking industry that there was a new sheriff in town, uh, that you would want to hand over the most impaired institutions to the FDIC and let them resolve them, and that you would want to start getting the financial sector down to a scale that was aligned with its actual usefulness in the economy. It's vastly too big, and that you would want that scale to favor smaller institutions which were not mismanaged over larger institutions that were. That opportunity was, in fact, con the, contrary to the policy followed by the Obama administration. I think that's a huge error, uh, reflects the politics of the day, perhaps the politics of the Congress, but it's for which, an error for which we're going to pay on the economic front. Can we recover from that error? Uh, I think the first task remains getting accountability, an audit, uh, and uh, a thorough exposure of the practices. The institution that is now charged with doing this is called the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, headed by a very responsible guy named Phil Angelides, used to be state treasurer in California. Uh, and um, it may or may not be able to do the job. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but that's where we are, and that institution has the, has the uh, call. It also has the authority under its statute to make criminal referrals as necessary. And from that, there either will or will not be an impetus for regulation. Something's going to have to change to have to change the political dynamic for that impetus to be successful. It's obvious, as uh, members of Congress themselves acknowledge, that the banks own the Congress. And it's obvious that as bills come through, they're going to get weakened so long as banking interests are more powerful than everybody else's. But as I say, I'm looking at a situation in which bankers and their bonuses have recovered and nobody else has, and it seems to me that that's a situation that has potential to make a lot of people very angry. And if that anger is channeled in a way that changes the political dynamic, then I'm not prepared to give up on, a, on, on both the most immediate important task, which is restructuring the industry, and secondly, imposing effective regulation going forward. I also want to say one other thing on that. Uh, at least one of the appointees of the Obama administration has been pretty good on this, and that's the guy who's running the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, Gary Gensler, who was had some considerable responsibility for the deregulation, but seems to have had a Damascene conversion uh, 
and to be pursuing the right courses. So it also depends greatly upon who gets these jobs uh, and how aggressive and effective they are. Yes? Um, actually, that was my question. Um, I I'll try to make my next answer shorter so as to not to... I, I want to compliment you. I think I read um, sometime within the last year you wrote an article for Fortune magazine, I think, about haven't we heard this story before, referring to the savings and loan, and it, it's the same thing. Um, in, in the future, uh, what do we need to tell our government, just that we want reform of the banks? Or I've also heard that the feds, uh, especially the New York Fed, has more power than the Middle West or the rest of the U.S. Would it help to democratize the, the Fed? Um, on the second part of the question, Congress should insist, and people should insist, that Congress have the right to full information about what the Federal Reserve has been doing. Alan Grayson, a very good congressman from Florida, has asked Christopher Dodd, Banking Committee Chairman in the Senate, to delay Ben Bernanke's confirmation until Bernanke coughs up answers to the basic question, what's in that $1.2 or so trillion dollars that the Fed added to its balance sheet? Who were they buying securities from? Who were they lending to? Right? The Fed has been unwilling to divulge that information. There's no excuse for that. This is not a national security matter. This is a matter of the greatest public interest and one where the Congress has the authority under the Constitution to get the information it needs from the Federal Reserve. So backing up Congressman Grayson and others in Congress who are insisting on more transparency from the Fed, it seems to me, would be a very, very good thing to do, a very responsible thing to do. Um, the, uh, so the other part of your question was, come back to me, sir, someone remind me. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, getting information from the Fed is, is, is in part democratizing it. I, I think that, um, I mean, I, I spent part of my career on the Hill doing oversight of the Federal Reserve, uh, and I'm a firm believer that it's the Congress that's got to do this job or nobody will. Um, one of the things the Fed wanted was to put regulatory power over the most dangerous institutions, so-called tier one financial holding companies, but I like to call them strate SDI, strategically, systemically dangerous institutions, <laughs> um, in the hands of the Fed and specifically at the New York Fed. And the argument was, well, they have the relationships. These are big financial companies. And this is, I testified on this, it's a terrible idea. Why? Because the New York Fed has on its board of governors the members of the directors of, appointed by those banks. So you're putting the regulation in, constitutionally into the hands of the uh, regulated, and that uh, obviously is a, I mean, it's, it's just a mess. Uh, I would, uh, so that should be resisted. Um, my view is that the right approach, I mean, I don't really care whether the New York Fed is democratized or not. It should be, the, the, all this regional bank stuff should be downsized. It's largely an employment program for otherwise idle economists. And uh, <laughs> much as I love my fellow professionals, it seems to me that they should not be the only people benefiting from socialism. <laughs> Your opinion of what this financial crisis in the U.S. is going to mean for the emergence of China? Okay, let me first start that by asking what did it mean already? China has integrated with the world economy. Nothing can stop that, nothing will. Uh, and the crisis had two important effects on China. One was a dramatic fall in demand for exports, so that tens of thousands of factories closed and millions of people either did not come in from the villages or had to go home or had to go do something else. So the major dislocation in southern China over this period. Uh, the second thing was a lot of money and as part of a kind of worldwide housing bubble, but particular centers of that bubble were in Beijing and Shanghai. And a lot of money went in to buy real estate in those two towns. 
and prices went down sharply. They've since started to recover. But that was also part and parcel of this. It's the same event in different countries. The Chinese have responded to that by stepping up public investment uh, in a lot of things, rails, um, housing, uh, roads and bridges, water systems, and in particular in the interior of the country. And I think that's, you know, from their point of view, a very good thing, because it helps balance out the urbanization of the country and it raises living standards. There will be, in 10 or 15 years, more high-speed rail in China than in the rest of the world put together. Well, it's just amazing. The Chinese are able to do this because of a very, I, you, you, I could go on on this subject for a long time because I've, I've, I have spent a lot of time in China. Uh, but if you have to ask who was the great influence that made it possible for the Chinese to finance their infrastructure spending, the answer is it's not Karl Marx. It's an American economist from the 19th century, Henry George, who was a great influence over Sun Yat-sen uh, and who set up uh, basically a system of local public finance in which the municipalities get their revenues by taking land rent. And as the c towns boom, there's more and more money for the government to spend on infrastructure. The results are very, very impressive. It's an idea that one might think about for, uh, uh, you know, to take over the, the properties directly. You don't have to charge property taxes or sales taxes. You just charge rents and put, put it back into tunnels and bridges and railroads. Uh, it's quite a system. So I think those are among the implications of the crisis. China is reorienting toward a domestic investment-driven uh, growth path. If it's successful, what you're going to see is that investment in China will be 50 percent of total output in China, incredibly high numbers in the next few years. Uh, you look back at the economics profession in the 40s, or actually in the 30s, and they were much more prepared, you might say, to deal with these sorts of problems. John Morris Clark, Ayers, young Canadian who had come down uh, to work for the Agriculture Department, uh, and that they were standing against the type of economics that we see today. Uh, today's world, the type of economists that address those problems are very, very far and few between. And I just wondered what you thought of the economics profession, their ability to contribute to the type of answers you're calling for. Are you trying to provoke me into saying something unpleasant? I'm a UMKC graduate, it, so it, it, it would not be It would not be difficult. Uh, they, uh, we have a serious problem in academic economics in this country and in the world, which is, as you say, while there are important intellectual traditions uh, that, uh, I mean, are onto the right problems and are analyzing them in a sens sensible way, those traditions are unrepresented in any so-called top economics department anywhere in the United States. Not a single person that I can think of. And uh, they hang on in liberal arts colleges, lesser state universities, uh, and sometimes in Washington think tanks. So the community of the internet ties us together. All my friends are out in that community. But the top rank, so-called, of the economics profession at that community is totally unrepresented. Uh, and that's, that wasn't true in the 50s and 60s at all. Uh, when the economics profession was much smaller, but much more diverse and much more interesting than it is today. Very serious problem. As far as young Canadians coming to work in the Department of, of Agriculture, there's another example for that. Uh, in 1934, that's exactly what my father, a young Canadian, did. Um, and he said a couple of days after he, he was passing through, basically, uh, Washington and visiting a friend and was immediately signed up to work in the New Deal, he said a couple of days after he took up his job, he was called upstairs to the representative of the Postmaster General, James Farley. And the Postmaster General, of course, was in charge of political patronage, and he wanted to know. He had one question. He said, young man, do you consider yourself to be a loyal member of the Democratic Party? And my father said, well, yes, of course. Uh, 
And that was fine, and that secured his employment, and the fact that he was not a citizen of the United States was not raised and would not have been considered relevant if it had been raised. <laughs> How do you see the handling of the next uh, shoe to drop, which of course is the uh, commercial real estate loans that are all coming due, starting in November and running through about March or April of this coming up year? Well, I guess in some perverse way, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> because I think if you're going to have a change of policy, you're going to need to have a new crisis. And, uh, if this proves to be, as I suspect it may, a very big problem, then uh, it's going to have to uh, be dealt with. And that may mean that you get to reassess everything that's been done so far. It would be a good thing. Yeah. Do you have? Do you see um, development of environmental jobs, green jobs, and uh, better transportation affecting uh, the economy, particularly in the U.S. in the coming decades? I'm sorry. The, the first part was jobs in transportation. Green jobs and better transportation. Um, More efficient forms. That is. I think. I mean, some parts of the green job possibility are very labor intensive. Uh, I'm not an expert in the area, but my impression is that uh, refitting buildings uh, is one area where you could employ an enormous amount of people if you could train them and, and get them employed and get the right materials in their hands and get, you know, the planning done. Uh, transportation is also, I think, very important. I'm not so sure that I know how much of a job creator it is. I mean, obviously, depending on the scale of the reconstruction, you're going to create jobs, but a great many of them are engineering type jobs. Any else? I would, I would like to know um, how you envision the face of capitalism, say, 10, 15 years from now. I have a friend whose son works for Goldman Sachs, and he will be getting an $8 million bonus. And his father asked him, well, what did you do to deserve that? And his father said there was a telling silence. So um, I would like to know if you really think there's going to be any fundamental changes coming out of this. Well, I'll, I think that the process of getting fundamental change begins with asking for it with demanding it, with specifying what it should be. Uh, and I think your question uh, raises an extremely important set of issues. Why is it that this one firm, which is closely tied to the government, with the personnel from the firm to that, to that one firm into the government being a, you know, it's a, uh, it's a major supplier of top-level officials to the Treasury Department, and of honoraria, speech honoraria, to people who never worked for it directly. Um, that firm was one that didn't need to be bailed out because the others got bailed out first. So its assets were refloated without having to be bailed out directly. Um, it's a firm which uh, has ended up in the situation where my understanding is its market position is much stronger than before the crisis. It's got fewer competitors. It's doing deals with a bigger margin. It's got the protection of the federal government because it's now a bank holding company, but it's not, so far as I know, in compliance with the leverage requirements for a bank holding company. Um, it's a firm. Um, which uh, it has been suggested was deeply involved in the manipulation of the oil market in the period before the crisis. Um, I think this raises real questions about who is the government and for what purpose is the government acting? questions that we ought to be raising. We ought to be asking competent authority, 
beginning with the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, to investigate thoroughly and in a credible way. He put the documentary record, uh, get testimony of people who are knowledgeable but no longer in the line of fire, and get the testimony of the principals. Let me just say a word about the problem of compensation in the financial sector. A big problem of compensation in the financial sector is that it gets, when it gets to a certain level, it's the case, I think, fair to say, that the interests of the chief executive officer and the interests of the industry as a going concern are not the same. You got so much money that you can leave the next day. Why should you care whether your firm, let alone the economy that it's working with, is in viable condition two years from now? Again, IBG, UBG, I'll be gone, you be gone, except we won't be gone. I like the idea of compensation limits for a simple reason. It would cause a lot of people to retire. Right? Now, seriously, it's not punitive. It is to say you get better enterprises when the people who are running them have a longer-term perspective because they're not being paid so much that they feel like they can walk out the next day and never have to work another day in their lives. It's not a good system when that's the case. So I think we need to think very carefully about what we permit in regulated financial institutions. Uh, and uh, that is probably a very central piece to, uh, to effective financial reform. Dr. Galbraith, there are no more questions. Okay, well.